We're picking up with our ninth lesson in Lessons from Legends. And we're looking at the centurion, the man who amazed Jesus. The man who amazed Jesus. The overview on your paper says, Of all the people Jesus encountered during his time here on earth, and by the way, we need to mention of all the people that were recorded in the scriptures. You read that last chapter there in the book of John and you find out that if they were to record everything that Jesus did in those three and a half years, that there's not enough volumes that could be written about the works of Jesus Christ. And so with everything we have written, only a few really impressed our Lord. One of these was a Roman centurion who displayed such generosity, humility, and faith that the Bible says Jesus marveled. In our lesson today, we will take a closer look at each of these qualities and see how this centurion exemplified them and learn how we can cultivate these traits in our own lives. Let's read the scriptures together, if we would. Let's follow along in the book of Luke, chapter 7, verses 6 through 9. And actually, let's go back to verse number 1 of this chapter, uh, the book of Luke, chapter 7, and verse number 1. Now, when he had called, or when he had ended, excuse me, all his sayings, in the audience of the people, he entered into Capernaum, and a certain centurion's servant, who was dear unto him, dear unto the centurion, was sick and ready to die. And when he had heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this." For he loveth our nation, talking about the centurion, he loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. Wow. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Wherefore, neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but I say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. Excuse me, but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers. And I say unto one, go, and he goeth. And unto another, come, and he cometh. And unto my servant, do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him. And turned him about and said to the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. There are only two times in the Bible that says Jesus Christ marveled. We find that the first time was in Mark 6 when the Lord marveled at the lack of the belief in the citizens of Nazareth. He found it astounding that the people could see so much and still be so blinded and refuse to believe. They had every reason to believe, and yet they chose not to believe. The second time is found here in Luke chapter 7. This is the story that we have before us of the Roman centurion whom amazed the Lord Jesus Christ with his generosity, his humility, and his faith. So number one this morning on our papers, let's look at the great generosity of the centurion. The great generosity with the financial uncertainty that many are facing these days. Now you wouldn't believe how many times that we uh, receive contact from people uh, that we either can help or we can't help in their situations because of their financial needs. And I understand that sometimes these are legitimate needs and other times it's just people looking for a little extra when they have so much already. And it's hard to know what is true and what is false in that area, but there are times around this world that financial troubles come. The philosophy of the world has always been look out for number one, meaning oneself. Those who focus is on their own personal needs cannot focus on the needs of others. It is even possible to be generous out of selfish motives. Let me give you an, uh, an illustration about generosity. Uh, one Sunday, a pastor told his congregation that the church needed some extra money and asked the people to prayfully consider giving a little extra in the offering plate. He said that whosoever gave the most would be able to pick out three hymns. After the offering plates were passed, the pastor glanced down and noticed that someone had placed a $1,000 bill in the offering. 
He was so excited that immediately he shared his joy with the congregation and said that he would like to personally thank the person who placed the money in that plate. A very quiet, elderly, saintly lady, all the way in the back, shyly raised her hand. The pastor asked her to come to the front. Slowly, she made her way to the pastor. He told her how wonderful it was that she gave so much and in thanksgiving asked her to pick out three hymns. Her eyes brightened and she looked over the congregation, pointing to three handsome men in the building and said, I'll take him and him and him. (laughs) Those who will reach out in generosity to others out of a heart of love will find great blessing as a byproduct. In other words, the greatest blessings come not from seeking a blessing, but rather from being a blessing. And that would be the point of the illustration this morning. Shortly after World War II had come to a close, Europe began picking up the pieces. Much of the old country had been ravaged by war, and it was in ruins. Perhaps the saddest sight of all was that of the little orphaned children after World War II who were starving in the streets of Europe and those war-torn cities. Early one chilly morning, an American soldier was making his way back to the barracks in London, and he, as he turned the corner in his jeep, he spotted a little lad with, those, with his nose pressed to the window of a pastry shop. Inside, the cook was kneading the dough for a fresh batch of donuts. The hungry boy stared in silence, watching every move. The soldier pulled his jeep to the curb and stopped and got out and walked quietly over to where the little fellow was standing. Through the steamed up window, he could see the mouth-watering morsels as they were being pulled from the oven, piping hot. The boy salivated and released a sigh and a slight groan as he watched the cook place them onto the glass in close counter ever so carefully. The soldier's heart went out to the nameless orphan as he stood beside him. He said, son, would you like some of those? The boy was startled. Oh, oh yeah, I would. The American stepped inside, bought a dozen, and put them in a bag, and walked back to where the lad was standing in the foggy cold of the London morning. He smiled and held out the bag and simply said, here you are. As he turned to walk away, he felt a tug on his coat. He looked back and heard the child ask quietly, Mr., Are you God? We are never so more like God than when we give. God so loved the world that he gave. And so as we examine the great generosity of the servant, letter A, let's look at generosity to his servant. In Luke chapter 7 and verse number 2, we saw those words, And a certain centurion's servant, who was dear unto him, was sick and ready to die. Although the centurion was a Roman, he was willing to humble himself to go to the Jews in order to get to Jesus. We see in this passage that the servant was dear to his master. And that even though the social status of this Roman centurion was far above that of the servant, he still cared deeply for his servant. God's word tells us to love the lowly and even the unlovely. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 14, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. In Romans 15, 1, Romans 15, 1, Then we that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Did you catch those words? Ephesians chapter 4, 32, you probably know it well. And be ye kind one to another, uh, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. In Luke chapter 6, 35, but love ye your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and ye shall be called the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. As we talk about the kindness and the love that we are to have one to another, it is a kindness and a love that we give to others without expecting anything in return. That's the kind of love that we should bring. This man was generous to his servant, but then I want you to see letter B, he was generous to the Jews. When you think about this, this is kind of amazing given the fact that he was a Roman, given the fact that he was not Jewish, and given the fact that there was great strife between them. It says in Luke chapter 7 and verse number 5, He loveth our nation, and he hath built us a synagogue. 
I mean, this Roman looked at the Jewish people and saw their need and said, you know what? I am a man of great authority. I have more money than I could use. And I'm going to build you Jews a synagogue. Could you imagine how these Jews felt with this kind of hearted man and what this man had done for their religion. And so we simply note from the beginning of this lesson that this man, this Roman, of which is the topic that Jesus marveled at, this man was very generous to people that it was unexpected for him to be generous to. Can I ask you a question? When was the last time you were generous to someone that you would normally battle a generosity to? where you broke through that pride of your heart and you broke through maybe a little bit of arrogance and you came to the place of saying, you know what? In the Bible I see that it doesn't matter the title, it doesn't matter the position, it doesn't matter who these people are, the Lord God loves them all and I need to as well. The generosity of this Roman centurion. Number two on our pages, I want you to see the great humility I know how throughout all the Bible, the need to be a humble servant of God is brought across. I mean, throughout the scriptures, we see various different verses like James chapter 4 and verse number 6. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but he giveth grace unto the who, church? The humble. And we talk about great humility. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 5, Likewise ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder, yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace unto the humble. Civil War, General George McClellan was put in charge of the great army of the Potomac, primarily because the public opinion was on his side. He enjoyed being told that he was a young Napoleon, However, history records that his efforts were less than sensational and that he was not a great military leader. One evening, President Abraham Lincoln and two of his staff members went to visit McClellan at his home. McClellan was at a wedding. One hour later, he appeared back at his home and did not even pay attention to the three men that were awaiting his return. Later, a servant reported back to the waiting party that McClellan had gone to bed. The president's associates were enraged. But Lincoln merely got up and led the way home. He said, this is not a time to be making points of etiquette and personal dignity. The president explained, I would hold McClellan's horse if he will only bring us to success. And the one who was the greatest in the nation at that time showed and displayed to his associates a great humility in spite of who he was named in our country. The famous humanitarian Albert Schweitzer Am I saying that name right? Albert Schweitzer, Schweitzer. He was once traveling by train. Some dignitaries came to meet him at the station. The first class unloaded, the second class unloaded. They turned to go, certain that he had missed the train. The third class unloaded and off came Dr. Schweitzer. Why were you riding third class? His reply, because there was no fourth class. Humility about certain people. On his 70th birthday, pioneer missionary William Carey wrote to one of his three sons, these, or his sons, these words, recorded by Timothy George in The Faithful Witness. I am this day 70 years old, a monument of divine mercy and goodness. Though on a review of my life, I find much, very much, for which I ought to be humbled in the dust. My direct and positive sins are innumerable. My negligence in the Lord's work has been great. I have not promoted his cause, nor sought his glory and honor as I ought. Notwithstanding all this, I am spared till now. I am still retained in his work, and I trust I am received into the divine favor through him. And my what humility, a man who really did do so much, stated in his letter to his son. Here's some quotes by Mark Twain. The fellow who blows his horn the loudest is usually in the biggest fog. Nature never intended for us to pat ourselves on the back. If she had, our hinges would be different. <laughs> Noise proves nothing. Often a hen who has merely laid an egg cackles as if she had laid an asteroid. <laughs> Miscellaneous quotes, a fellow who brags about how smart he is wouldn't if he were. 
The only time you should blow your horn is when you're in the band. A person interrupts and endangers his climb up the ladder of success when he stops to pat himself on the back. The minute a man begins to feel his importance, his friends begin to doubt it. Intelligence is like a river. The deeper it flows, the less noise it makes. As we talk about the great humility of this Roman centurion, I want you to see letter A, he was not worthy to come to Jesus. Not worthy to come to Jesus. If you look at Luke chapter 7, verse 3, And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. Then in verse number 7, Wherefore neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but I say in a word, or but say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. This man understood the fact that he was not worthy for the master to even come unto his own house. In the book of Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in need. Even though we are not worthy to come to Him, because of who our Savior is, we can come to Him. So there needs to be an understanding of our, in our lives that we are unworthy, but yet at the same time, God counted us so worthy that He sent His only begotten Son to die on the cross for our sins. He was not worthy to come to Jesus, but he was not worthy for Jesus to come unto him, let her be. In verse 6 and 7, and Jesus went with them. So now Jesus has heard the cry. Jesus is coming to the house. And we see that the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest come enter under my roof. Wherefore neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee. The Lord decided to go to his house to heal the servant. There are three truths of which we should be aware of in this passage. Number one, the centurion's recognition that Jesus had the ability to heal the servant. Whatever you're going through in life, whether it's an emotional turmoil, a financial struggle, whether it's a physical ailment, whatever it may be, we need to, like this Roman, come to God with an understanding that we recognize that Jesus is able. Don't we sing that song sometimes? He's able. He's able. I know He's able. I know He is able to deliver me. And He can. And He will. We must believe. As we look at a second thing that this passage reveals to us, this Romans realization that the Lord did not need to be physically present to perform His miraculous workings. And doesn't that mean something to you and I today? The Lord is on His way. I know He is coming, but this proves to us that we do not have to have His physical being right in this place to have His touch unto His healing. This Roman believed that if you would just speak the word, I would be, or my servant would be healed. So there's a recognition that Jesus had the ability, but then there's a realization that Jesus didn't even have to be presently with Him to see his need met. And then we see his regard of his own worthiness, unworthiness. He did not count himself worthy. And this passage just oozes with that. He sent his people, then he sent his friends unto Jesus Christ to bring those words unto him. In Matthew 28, 18, the Bible says, Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me. In John 6, 6, this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. In Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. In Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And this man was simply believing in the mercy and the goodness of a miracle working God. Whatever your need is, whether it's salvation, whatever your need is, whether it's physical healing, believe that He can do it. Do not bind the hands of God. This great generosity and this great humility leads us to a great faith, number three. Great faith, number three. God makes it clear. He requires faith from us. He is pleased by faith. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, without faith it is impossible to please Him. 
And by all means, our ministry should not be run with a business mindset, but with a faith mindset. Amen. Though we understand that there is business involved in ministry, we need to have faith and exercise faith. Because yet there are elements that may be the same. This is completely different. This is the church of God, the church of Jesus Christ, that is to be exercised in and with great faith. He blesses faith. When you come with Him or unto Him with faith, He will reward you for diligently seeking Him. Time after time throughout the Scripture, we see that people who lived by faith were blessed by the Lord through the faith in which they possessed the faith faith in which they lived out. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, faith, the elders obtained a good report. And then throughout that chapter of which I just quoted the first couple of verses, there begins to be a listing of these different people throughout the lives of the Bible that we could record and recall that have lived by faith and stepped out when maybe someone else wouldn't step out. Isaac Rankin says that just outside his window is a large wire which carries a heavy current of electricity for light and power. It is carefully insulated at every pole and is out of common reach. However, he says, if I could lean out far enough to grasp it, death would be swift and as a lightning would strike the earth, my life would be taken. Yet the doves in my neighborhood suffer no harm when they perch on it. They fly from my windowsill where I sometimes feed them and preen in safety and contentment on the cables. The secret is that when they contact the wire, they touch nothing else. My danger would be that should I attempt to reach out and do so, the walls of my house would act as a ground and the current would turn my body into a channel through which the electricity would flow in damaging power. Because they rest wholly upon the wire, they are unharmed. So God would have us to seek our safety in complete surrender to His power. It is when we reach one hand to Him while still holding fast the other hand to some forbidden thing that we are in danger. A life completely yielded to God is what He desires from us. This is referring to great faith. Everyone knows how to have faith. We do it all the time in countless ways. When we get in a car and turn the ignition key on, we can have faith that the car will start. Simple faith. When I pick up a ballpoint pen and press it down on a sheet of paper, I am exercising faith in the ability of that pen to write. When I sit down to eat and put my wife's cooking into my... No, I shouldn't say that. I exercise faith that it will not kill me. We exercise faith day by day in countless ways and we exercise it with people and things around us. Likewise, when Jesus asks us to have faith in Him, He is only asking us to do what is natural for us to do in a certain way stated by Bill Gordon. Man, faith is not to be made harder than what it really is. And we use simple everyday illustrations. And how much greater is God than a ballpoint pen? Amen. Amen. How much greater is God than the ignition in our car? How much greater is God than these earthly illustrations like sitting down in a chair, simply believing that chair would hold us up? God is so much greater. Letter A on our pages. I want you to see great faith shown. In verse number 7 of our chapter today, Wherefore neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say in a word. You see that? Say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. Now notice verse number 8. For I am also, or also a man set under authority. That means uh, I understand that there are those above me. But I understand that I have authority. I have under me soldiers. And I say unto one, go, and he goeth. To another, come, and he cometh. And to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. The great faith is shown in this simple statement that he brought before the Lord. As we look at verse number 9, when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned him about and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. 
Why is Jesus saying that I have seen great faith? Which, by the way, that's letter B. Great faith is shown. Great faith is seen. The Lord Jesus Christ recognizes faith. His faith was in a simple illustration of what he, as a servant of God, performs every day. I believe the Lord. I believe that you are greater than me. I believe that if you would simply speak it, that it would get done. Because every single day of my life, I say to my servant, all I do is give a word. I don't have to go with them and oversee the project and bale the hay for them. I don't have to go with them to the well and bring up the water from it. All I do is say to my servant, go, and he goeth. And when I have need in my personal life with help, I say to my servant, come, and he cometh. Do you see the illustration that this man is using? And he is testifying to the Lord, Lord, I believe in your power through your word. And isn't that what the Bible is all about? The power of this book that we hold in the hands. God moving through His Word. There's numerous occasions where the Word of the Lord is seen as that being in power. There's sometimes that we see it in the Scriptures where it shows us He's just holding back His power a little bit, or we could actually say quite a bit. If it was the spoken word of God that created this world, man, how much could God do? Listen, there's nothing God cannot do. There's nothing that is impossible to Him. Everything is possible to our God, but we can bind the hands of God, can't we? We read about this in the Scriptures, New Testament, Old Testament. In the Old Testament, Exodus, the Israelites, as they left the land of Egypt, going to Canaan land, they limited God. Then in the New Testament, in the book of Matthew, we've seen it recently on a Sunday night, I believe it was, that they, because of their unbelief, Jesus could not do their many mighty works. They bound the hands of God behind His back because of their unbelief. And I ask you a question. What in your life needs to be addressed? What in your life needs to be taken care of? In what ways are you binding God's hands? God says, I want to do for you abundantly more than you can ask or think. I want to meet your needs. I want to show you my goodness, but there's a degree of my goodness that you will never experience until you unbind my hands by getting rid of your disbelief and your unbelief and start believing that not only am I able but that I will. Do you see the faith of this man? Does it challenge you one bit at all to just have simple faith? It's amazing what things we allow to get in our way sometimes that distract us and hinder us. When in the grand scheme of things, there's things that are so much bigger. Now people in life go through huge things. They go through turmoils and troubles. And it's amazing how Something so little can cause so much pain. You ever gotten a splinter before? No. And it was the only thing you could think about until somebody removed it. Especially as a kid, that's kind of how it was, isn't it? You think of a kid getting a splinter, everything stops. The games, the eating, the sleep, it ain't going to happen until this splinter is removed. Something so little that causes so much pain. Something in your eye, like a granule of sand, though it's so small, can irritate you so badly that the thing you want to do is touch your eye. You've got to get to a mirror. You've got to get this thing out. Your eye's turning red. I can't see very well. My eyes are getting rotted. It's so tiny, but yet it's hindering me so much. And I ask you a question, whether it's a great big thing or a little thing, how much greater is God than anything in this world? And we just simply need to believe that He can take care of it. If He had a bodily resurrection from the grave, there's nothing our God cannot do. If He created this world, there's nothing He cannot do. I mean, when we think about all these things, the purpose of the message today is to get us to realize our God is able. And then the life that we need to lead that shows our God that we believe He is able. A life that says from God, man, I marvel at your faith. I marvel at your humility. I marvel at your great generosity. Giving to someone who other people aren't giving to. Having a humility that you as a person in authority, not everybody has that. Having a faith that receives from God 
impossible things. And that is what Jesus marveled at. More than ever before, we need to be people today who will show the world a spirit of generosity, great humility, and a walk of faith. Do we want to be different from Christ or do we want to be like Christ? Here is a good start, starting to live like this Roman. There is no doubt these attributes will bring amazement to a world that is often selfish, proud, and dependent upon sight. For we walk by faith, not by sight. And we have a God that may not be presently here with us, but haven't we seen Him do so much in our lives and in the lives of others? There's no need to turn back now. He'll make a way somehow. He's good. Let's give him the glory. Let's pray.